Nick, 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 Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, responding to our weird message on Instagram. Really appreciate it. We never know how those are going to go. So. How weird was the message? I don't remember it being that. <laughs> it wasn't weird. It, it was, was just probably pretty formal. Probably pretty formal, but uh, I always throw in, like, I don't like the name drops, so it's, like, hard to, like, throw in some of the people we've had, and then you're just probably okay. like, eh, like, forget you. But thank you very much for coming on. Sure. Um, what we want to do first before we get into some of the shows, specifically the Nickelodeon ones you worked on, uh, tell us about your background, how you got into like television writing and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just totally weird and idiosyncratic. I mean, I was trying to be a writer, and uh, I wonder what was the first TV show I actually wrote on. Wow. Uh, it, I know it sounds really strange to say, but it might have been Saturday Night Live. Uh, uh, because I was a performance artist and video artist. And I guess before Saturday Night Live, there was uh, Mr. Mike's Mondo Video, which was something that Michael O'Donoghue did that was really tasteless and wonderful. And um, I did a bunch of pieces for him. And, and that uh, it ended up, it was supposed to be a Saturday Night Live replacement show, and it ended up being um, a movie that they ran. Uh, it was weird. And uh, then I got hired at SNL. I really do think that might be true that it was the first thing I did in TV. And then I, um, after that, I did, a, you know, a ton of stuff. So I went from there. What years were you at SNL? I was there in, uh, well, I guess 79 was Mr. Mike's Mondo Video. So M Michael O'Donoghue was a writer at SNL, and he had, like, money from them to do a, a special and that might be a pilot, I guess. And then uh, I was there in 80. Wow, cool. So how did, how did like, the thing – I guess, like, we uh, relate Nickelodeon with, like, a kid's network, even though they were kind of, like, adult humor and stuff. Like, how did the transition go from all of that to, like, a, a Nickelodeon network? Well, it actually was normal in New York City to um, – in those days, to write for kids' TV and for adults. Oh. Like, if you look at a lot of the writers on SNL, you know, a bunch of them wrote for uh, Sesame Street and uh, other places. Maybe not SNL so much, but a lot of the um, National Lampoon. There, there, was, there was only two businesses. There was kids and there was comedy in New York, if you're a writer. And uh, so... So people went back and forth, and my writing, my adult stuff was very childlike, and my kid stuff was very adult. Oh. And so it was just a matter of time that one or the other was going to win. <laughs> At least that's how I saw it. So what, what do you find, what did you find harder to do, right, for a kid's network or right for an adult network? Oh, I, well, harder isn't the right word. I found it much more fun to write for kids, I felt you could get away with more interesting stuff for kids. See, to me, when I was on Saturday Night Live, it was kind of boring. They didn't want any of my really original stuff. They wanted parodies. They wanted, you know, jokes in a traditional way. Now, I kind of got there at the wrong time because if you watch all the Saturday Night Live in those days, there were two kinds of humor. There was the parody, basomatic kind of stuff that uh, a lot of them did. And then there was this sort of um, on the street, kind of offbeat, weird comedy that d happened in Saturday Night Live. And by the time I got there, they decided to stop doing all the, the weird stuff, the cool, weird stuff. And Letterman ended up doing all that stuff. And so the, all they wanted was parodies. And I still did some stuff that was cool, but it was mostly stuff that I wasn't that interested in. And, um, and you know, it, it was a weird working environment, so I really didn't care much. Nice. Yeah, I was going to ask. I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Brian, go on. 
What's it like as far as like the, the pressure of writing for something like Saturday Night Live? Because you only have a week's time. Right. You know? So right. It's, not like, it's not like you're putting together a show and you're like, all right, let's start work on the new season. And then right, right. you've got right. six weeks to come up with the first episode right. and how this right, is right. going to be. It was, it was uh, worse than that because it's a very predatory environment. Mm. Everybody's competing to get a sketch on and everybody's like, you know, trying to figure out how they can maneuver themselves into the best position. And mm. it, it's an interesting dynamic uh, because it's what happens when you come to a place after it's peaked because Saturday Night Live, when the original crowd was there, they were all very predatory, nasty, and did all these crazy things to each other, but they were friends. Mm. And so that was okay. Whereas then when I came in there, they were still kind of had this system where everybody was still doing this sort of pitting against each other thing, but nobody was friends anymore. So it wasn't that much fun. And uh, so it, it, was a, it was an intense thing, but on the other hand, you know, it was, it also, you know, you did what you could do. I don't know. I mean, I did something that was so different than everybody else that it really, I knew, once I knew they weren't going to really take my stuff. Now, I'll tell you the most interesting thing at Saturday Night Live, though, is that I was considered in the beginning teacher's pet, the producer's okay. pet for a while. And I had this great deal. I had the corner office that was very cherished, and I was doing video. I was writing, and I was a, a featured performer, too. Yeah. And so I kind of had the best deal, right? And uh, and for a while, the producer, this woman, uh, really, you know, thought I was her pet. I mean, she just thought she wanted to take me everywhere. So we had auditions for that show, that season, which sucked. I mean, the season I was there sucked, and um, with a few exceptions. And uh, they did auditions where um, I saw people like, uh, Pee Wee Herman, mm. for instance, who auditioned with a, a rack of costumes that, no, not Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, Pee Wee Herman, right? Paul Rubens, right? Paul Rubens, yeah. Yeah. Paul Rubens. yeah, yeah. Where he had a rack of clothes that were the costumes of every character that ended up being in Pee Wee's Playhouse. Wow. And he did each character in the audition, and they passed on Wow. On Right, I know, it's amazing. They had, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other people. Oh, I was in the office, and so she invited me to all the auditions, right? I was in her office when Andy Kaufman came in to pitch what he wanted to do regularly on the show. And he pitched this great concept they had already done one of, and it was really out there and great, and she passed on that, you know? Wow. So I saw all the great things that I already knew that, you know, she's passing on everything <laughs> that's going to be great. And, you know, instead she hires these other people, you know. And then I saw Eddie, Eddie Murphy was there. And Eddie was, like, better than the game. He already had his thing figured out. Yeah. And he, you know, he, he just maneuvered through the system and, and, you know, he was very slick. He was very cool. But he was just a talented person. I think it's almost like something like SNL for him is like a muzzle on a dog. You yeah. know? Like it's well, he saw it as a chance though for him to show everything he could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he thought it was easy pickings. Yeah. I mean, like what you're saying. He thought he saw it as like, oh, these ideas are all worked up and all these honestly, all these white people are doing this and the other thing, and I'm gonna find my little niche. I'm gonna make it you know, my point, and then, you know, that he left, you know. But I think he really was better than the game over there. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. What was it like to be around, uh, like, to be in an audition and see Andy Kaufman? Like, is there, was there a side of him that, because obviously, I mean, I didn't get to see him growing up. Um, we've only had the Jim Carrey movie where we were kind of privy to his behavior right. and all the ways that he acted and stuff like that. Was he even like that, like without a camera on? You know, it's funny, actually. No one's ever asked me about it. I didn't see, he, it wasn't an audition. It was more informal than that. It was literally, I was sitting here, Andy Kaufman was sitting here and the producer was across uh, the desk and Andy was pitching what he wanted to do every week. He was very normal. 
it was in that situation it was very normal i've seen him perform i mean i went to one of the most amazing performances he did which was a carnegie hall performance mm -hmm. where when the performance was over there were buses outside ready to take us for milk and cookies and uh halfway through the performance clifton whatever his character came on and like started yelling at everybody so you know i've seen what he does but he was like in that meeting i can't remember anything more than like you know he's an artist trying to get his his thing done and mm. do something every week she was nuts not to take him crazy yeah that sounds like looking back i know like the hindsight 2020 thing it is crazy how certain people are passed up and i mean they become who they are but hey at least you had it you had an eye for it though at least you knew you probably left those <laughs> telling your friends oh, I, yeah. there's two people you need to watch out for you know yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were right there. I mean, you could tell they were talented. There was a woman. There were some other people who became famous in other ways. Like there was this woman, Mercedes Ruel, who became a movie star uh, and actress in a bunch of movies. At that time, she was kind of like a Lily Tomlin performer. And she was jaw dropping. I mean, there, there were a bunch of other people. There were just draw. There were plenty of people. Every time they had to choose between somebody who was phenomenal and somebody who is kind of normal and somewhat boring, they chose the boring people. So I knew it wasn't going to last very long. All right, it makes sense. So when you when you left SNL, like how did you ultimately end up at Nickelodeon? Uh, well, I guess I did. After SNL, I did. Um, there was a thing called the Comedy Channel before there was the Comedy Network, right? Is it called the Comedy? What's it called now? Comedy uh, Network. Comedy Central, maybe. It's comedy Central now. It was called the Comedy Channel. <laughs> And I got hired to produce two shows there. Uh, one was uh, Higgins, Boys, and Gruber, which is interesting because that's Dave Higgins, Steve Higgins, and David Gruber. And so Steve Higgins became the head writer at SNL. And, um, and he also was the sidekick for, who was he the sidekick for? Fallon. Wasn't he the sidekick? and amazing comedian and his brother Dave who's been in a lot of sitcoms and they were amazing so I produced like three episodes a week of that which was a lot but then at the same time I produced this thing called the Rachel Sweet Show the Sweet Life and she was a, a singer who had a couple of hits but she was really like a a, a powerhouse and she was funny and, and we had like three shows of hers to do. So I did that, it was a comedy channel. What else, I did, I did another couple of late night segments where they tried to take my video art and turn them into late night segments. Some, I guess a couple of them went. And then I guess, you know, I kind of had a choice between working at Nickelodeon and continuing on the comedy side. And, uh, you know, when you look at SNL versus Ren and Stimpy, which one is weirder, funnier, and more out there and more important? I don't think there's any question right. that Ren and Stimpy is way more important. You know, right? So I would agree with that. Uh, then, there's probably stuff going, bro. Yeah, no, Ren and Stimpy, I felt was a, a cartoon that helped push along uh, what a cartoon could be. Totally. Because prior to that, I mean, you have it's all like very basic stuff. They don't really touch on anything like. Brendan Stimpy really was revolutionary in how the, the topics that it approached. And for a children's thing, I remember, I think I was maybe seven or eight the first time I saw Ren and Stimpy. And it was like, I caught it by accident because we weren't allowed to watch it at the time. So it was, it was when you saw it, when it's like forbidden like that, you're like, oh my God, I'm watching something that I shouldn't be. And then when you, but like, obviously you're too young to get some of the concepts that were going on. No, I utterly agree with your analysis, which is that, and it goes a lot to what my relationship with John Chris Lucy was in that show. John uh, restarted animation. He, he, it was like he started the, the clock over again in animation. And his effect and liberation of people in animation is absolutely unparalleled. And what his thing was, and the reason why he, hate, he hated me, by the way, one reason <laughs> why he, is because I was a writer. 
And so just to put it in context a little bit, um, you know, early days of animation, like Bugs Bunny, Betty Boop, all that crazy stuff in the early mm -hmm. days of animation, there were no writers involved. Writers didn't write those things. That was an artist drawing gags in a storyboard, right? Mm -hmm. He'd draw the drawings. And just like silent comedy, you know, there was a bunch of comedians, physical comedians figuring out what they were going to do, right? So animation came from animators, from drawers, from storyboard artists, right? Mm -hmm. Then it hit this really dead period, uh, which is what John was reacting and you're reacting to, which is when it was... Um, <clears throat> um, a He-Man and She-Ra and, and the Smurfs and all this stuff. And I wrote on some of that because I needed a gig, but, um, but it was written. And I remember saying to the, I worked on Alf Tales, and I remember saying to the producers, do you really want me to write all this visual stuff? Because why don't you get an artist to do this? Why do you need a, a writer to say, oh, it, that hammer transforms into an anvil that transforms into a tree. I mean, who needs that, right? And, but that's the way they did it. They had writers write it, they sent it to the Philippines to animate, and the artists were gone. There were no artists. Wow. So John comes in, and John's mission with Ren and Stimpy is to make animation done by artists again, mm -hmm. which I actually agree 100% with. But I was the guy, writer, hired by Nickelodeon to oversee the development and story editing, right? So I go to meet with him, and he's just decided that I'm the enemy, no matter what. And I understand. And I'm like, look, you know, I'm just trying to help here, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the first day, he was totally confrontational. And the first day, he says to me, you know, I'm the best writer. <laughs> wow. I said, that's okay, you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I work a little bit longer, and he says, no, I'm the best writer. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine, I get it. And he says it again, and then I say, All right, William Shakespeare, William Faulkner, John Chris Lucy, that's the best writers in the world. There you go. Great, let's move on. <laughs> and the bottom line is that. He was right, 100% right. He was great. The problem was that he had a lot of crazy obsessions that were so he wasn't in control of. Okay. And mm. So he would turn in a deck, which is, you know, a storyboard deck is like, it's like long and it's, mm -hmm. and it, should, it should be for the length of cartoon he was doing, it should be about this thick, right? But it would be about that thick. About three times. Mm. And it would be feel, filled with sadomasochistic scenes <laughs> and stuff that we couldn't do, right? So, so I had to like say, well, you have to cut this and you have to cut that. So he hated me no matter what I did. But I didn't really disagree with him, you know. So. Right. You just realized you couldn't put some of that stuff on air. Like, so you essentially were saving him and he didn't realize it. <laughs> Oh, well, he wasn't really geared for success. You know, he was okay. kind of geared for it. You know, I don't blame him. Listen, to me, I think it's more the fault of, you know, there were some particular people in the cartoon division who just weren't realistic with John and some of the other creators saying, look, this is what you can't. I mean, they were so, it was from good intentions. They wanted to liberate the animators and make them do the most amazing things. And they did. But then, at some point, you have to get realistic about, well, you can't hand in a 30-minute uh, storyboard for a two-minute cartoon. Right. You know? Yeah. That's now, just because the thing, you know. I would say, yeah, Ren and Stimpy were probably a little edgier as, like, a, a story story editor. Like, when you did Doug and the Rugrats, I would assume, maybe I'm wrong, you didn't have to cut out as much? Or did you guys, did some people try to insert a little, a little well, more adult things in there? Just to be fair, they all hated me. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and, uh, they hated me because I was given, you know, it, you know, I was told to be the editor, and they didn't want any restrictions mm. at all. And honestly, uh, I mean, I sometimes, sometimes I was right, but sometimes they were right too. I mean, I'm, I'm very. It was listen. It was a cauldron of of work and uh, there were things about uh, my, my, the reason why I was there was that I had worked in, anim, in, in kids and in adult entertainment, 
And the formula at Nickelodeon was do something that you love, but that kids will love too. And that was kind of a dual premise, right? It's really cool, but it's something that kids can relate to. That's what Ren and Stimpy was. I hope that's what Clarissa was. So the bottom line is my job was to make sure both levels were in there. I call it dual premise writing, you know, where you've got something that is, you know, like Sesame Street does this all the time. So like uh, Cookie Monster doing, uh, what's it called? Um, Monsterpiece Theater. Well, there is no kid who knows what Masterpiece Theater is, which is a parody. Of Monsterpiece, is a, Monsterpiece is a parody of Masterpiece. So, but it's funny to look at Cookie Monster, you know, with a pipe in a chair, you know? Right. And so it works on both levels. So the whole thing on the Nick animation, when it really worked well, is it worked for little kids, but also worked for everybody else too. Kind of like the Beats in being the Beatles and Doug, things like that. You guys would throw yeah. things in. Yeah. And, and Doug, listen, honestly, Doug and Rugrats, they were all really great writers. And they were, I mean, they had their own issues with each other sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Like, and Rugrats is pretty well known how much they were all fighting with each other, you know? Mm -hmm. But I had a job too, you know, and it was the Nickelodeon wanted me to make sure they did these things and it shape it, you know? I think I had a, a, a good effect, but after a while they got tired of me tell, you know, giving them any kind of, the irony, they got tired of me, period. But the irony is that at one point, Rugrats was the best example. They really wanted Nickelodeon to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Nickelodeon came to me and because they needed me. And they said, look, uh, we're going to let you go, you know, from Rugrats. And, you know, I do enough other things that it wasn't the end of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they said, but when we let you go, we want you to just keep doing the job. And then we want you <laughs> to notes to this wonderful young woman who was my assistant, who now is an executive at, you know, other places. And she'll give them the notes, right? And we'll tell them that we fired you. Oh, man. But they'll be happier, but we'll still get you to do the job, right? And I'll get paid, I guess. And then... Uh, so I did that for a while, and right away, they were like, "Oh, these notes are so much better." Than of course, mine. yeah, of course. That's amazing, though. You built up. It was kind of like a "Don't Kill the Messenger" thing. You were just doing your job, but they just didn't like it. It's kind of like if you make music, and the final, like if Brian mixes it and takes something out, it's like that's his job. But I'm the writer, and I'm like, "No, you had to leave that part in," you know? Right. right. Yeah, it's one of those things that happen. So how did you get how did you get the oak with with all that I don't want to say turmoil, how'd you get the okay then for a creation of a show? How'd you pitch that with Clarissa? That was always happening at the same time. So okay. they were like I was doing all those animation series as a story editor and Clarissa at the same time. Wow. And uh, so the way Clarissa happened was kind of weird in a way because I had they had never done a sitcom mm -hmm. and a friend of mine kind of had a better in and was well more known than I was more well known than I was at the time. And so this friend had a, uh, got us a deal to write a sitcom together for Nickelodeon. And, um, and it was a really crummy idea. It was like, um, I think it was like an alien family and an earth family swap kids or something yeah, really dumb and obvious. Uh, didn't they make a, but didn't they make a movie of that? Somebody did it. It was yeah. a typical idea, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm sure it was done a hundred yeah. times after yeah. that, yeah. So it was just a typical cliche idea, right? And But, you know, what did I know? I had never written a sitcom either before, and this guy was more experienced. So I thought, okay, we got a deal. We'll get to do this. Then he deserted the deal, and he went to L.A. because Norman Lear, you know, all the family, uh, wanted him or offered him a job as a writer on a show, right? And his aspiration was to go to Hollywood. That's what he wanted to do. I couldn't give a shit about Hollywood. In fact, I didn't like Hollywood and I didn't want to go to Hollywood. So when he left, the deal kind of fell to me. And I had to figure out now suddenly, what did I really want to do? Mm. And I talked to Jerry Laborn, who created Nickelodeon, mm -hmm. and she gave me all this information about the audience and, and 
all this data that the advertising firms had put together about kids. And so I came up with, you know, the idea of a girl and I came up with the idea of the show from there. I just, I took what, what I felt like would I, I, I created a show that I thought that Nickelodeon kids would watch and feel like, Oh, that's me. Mm. Or what I want to be. If not. Me. Yeah. Now, was that, it was in- such, that was such a good idea though, with like uh, breaking the fourth wall with having Clarissa have a thing and explain it and talk and how she feels about it and then go back to the actual story. It was perfect for that relation of a kid because I think maybe girls m- might have felt it more than guys, but it was still very similar situations. Well, you know, the audience, I designed that show. The, the, uh, the conventional wisdom at the time was that boys wouldn't watch a girl and girls would watch a boy. And they didn't have, it was the first girl sitcom. Mm. And they didn't believe a girl could carry a show. And I had the theory that boys and girls aren't that different at that time. And that if you didn't piss off the boys or do something that was going to be weird for the boys, like putting on makeup or make it about, you know, things that boys couldn't relate to, that they would all watch it. And the truth was, and everything in the show, especially that first season, like the opening was designed for boys to like it as much as girls. And the truth is the first season, there were probably a few more, at least 50, 50, if not better for boys watching Clarissa. Yeah. Because it wasn't a girl. (laughs) What? I watched. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a girly girl. She wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't icky or, you know, about makeup. It wasn't, she was a person. I mean, right. my point of view was she was a kid first who was a girl. Yeah. It's like a boy it was a kid first and he's a boy, you know? Yeah. And I just we were, remember, I, let me get, let me say this oh, one. No. I remember the first time I saw it as a kid. And obviously at that time I didn't understand it. But as I got older, I understood it a little bit more. Um, like the whole aspects of just simple uh, with the way men and women are. M- women are more emotional and men are more logical. So when you would have a situation play out in the show and she would express her emotions, but then logically break down what was going on, you were going, it's almost like subconsciously, you're going to get both sides, you know, because that's why I was hooked in, why she would explain Oh, what is she going to explain? How did she feel about this? Like, what happened in this? You know. Yeah. No, I I love doing it. It was great. I would I would say too. Um, we went to we were in like you know, we were younger when the show came out, and at that time, I know it's like it's a little um, controversial now to distinguish girl show, boy show, with everything going on in the world. But like at that time. It wasn't necessary. I remember if you watched, like, I don't know, I'm just throwing a name, My Little Pony as a kid growing up, and you had a My Little oh, Pony. Tell us all about how you watched My Little <laughs> Pony as a No, but, like, you would go to school in third grade, first grade, and be like, oh, that's a girl show. That's a girl show. Why right. do you watch that? That never was the case with Clarissa, though. Right, right, right. Oh. It was never the case. It was like, oh, did you watch Clarissa? Yeah, it was never, oh, that's a girl show. Like, that wasn't a right. thing. I'm also telling some repressed memories from when I was a child. <laughs> no, but nobody ever said that, and nobody. It wasn't a problem, and and boys liked it. I've been, I've had every kind of human being, you know, black, white, you know, gay, uh, trans, anything. Everybody got it and yeah. felt like it was a person that they could be friends with and relate to. I'll tell you what was hard that I never got to do that I tried a lot is a show kind of like you two. <laughs> I always wanted to do a boy show. Yeah. That was like, you know, the other side of that coin, you know, would be, you know, just like you had a girl that did what you just described. Well, you could have a boy that could do that mixture of stuff, right? A full human being, right? Somebody who like, yeah, he's a boy, but he's also got some emotions. You know what I mean? Yeah, she's a girl, but she's got a lot, you know, these things, People really have to do both, right? Yeah. yeah. And I had a show called What's Going On Down There? And it was two brothers in the basement. And they did crazy wild stuff like turn off, get baseball bats and padding and turn off the lights and then go, you know, swinging in the dark at each other, you know, <laughs> and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and But they were really interesting kids. And they talked to camera and they were brothers. 
<laughs> and I got, I got a pilot at, at CBS, but it never went further. And I tried, I've, I've written so many boy sitcoms, but here's the thing. What they say now is what they said about Clarissa. So when Clarissa first, I first pitched Clarissa, they said, well, boys won't watch a girl. Now when you pitch a boy show, they say, oh, girls won't watch a boy. Yeah. It's, all, it's, it's bullshit. It is it's bullshit. Just complete crap. You know? And for what's weird is for like the way as open-minded as like uh, these stations try to come off or whatnot or how, right. you know what I'm, you know where I'm going. So right. like, for them to be that tone deaf and that yeah. stereotypical is just right. complete hypocrisy. Well, boys are still, this is not even a small issue and a small passion. This is a big thing. Boys are, are, are really need that kind of stuff more, you know, finding uh, yeah. models for boys. They're not good role models. And, you know, and there's more put upon boys now. I mean, yeah, there was a time where girls were limited in what they could do but that's not true anymore now there are more things around boys that are limited and and there's a and there's, the conventional wisdom is not you know this 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 phrase here's a telling thing boys will be boys that's mm -hmm. not what the phrase was originally it's from latin it really is children will be children mm. but they twisted it to be about boys and it says, when they say girls will be girls, they're saying girls have to be girls, right? right. But when they say boys will be boys, they're saying something bad. Oh, right. what do you do? Boys will be boys. You know what I mean? So there's a real cultural yeah. you know, thing there that's a bias is the easiest way to put it. Yeah, that's, that's, I never thought of it. I mean, you were in the depths of it, so it's really cool to hear like the inside information. Um, when it comes to, I always say this, and I'm sure everyone said this to you who's talked about Clarissa, you couldn't have picked a more perfect actress. It yes. just worked. Like, it just worked. And like, I know the story behind, like, she hated new kids on the block. That's right. why she kind of got the job. Like, right. what what else struck you about Melissa Joan Hart? That, Wait a like, minute, I don't know that. Oh, tell the story then, Mitchell. Yeah. Go on. How you? Well, first of all, I was looking, and uh, there are actually two girls that were really possible. One was actually more outside than Melissa. She was more of a quirky, unusual girl, but. Melissa had this quality that she light, lightened up the screen. She just has this light quality. Mm -hmm. And she came in and she read, uh, it was funny, she read um, twice and she wore exactly the same clothes, which is common with actors. They'll wear the same clothes to an audition if they get called back. And it went, one thing was overalls on a pink shirt, I think. And I mean, it was already, she was already perfect in like the colors to the show colors were pink and blue, which was the boy girl thing already. And she had these, these overalls and the, the, the strap fell down at the same place in the monologue every time. And, and she was obviously incredible. She was, she was natural, but she had chops because the problem in those days was that actors is not so much a problem now, but actors used kid actors were overtrained. Mm -hmm. And they say, he misses this. Yeah. And, Hi, how are you doing? And she had this totally natural quality, but she could, you know, she's in every single scene and, and Clarissa explains it all forever. I mean, she, there was never, we never shot anything without her. Wow. It was crazy. And she knew all of her lines and everybody else's lines. Sometimes she didn't even know what certain words meant, but she could deliver them as if she did. I mean, she's extraordinary, right? So the uh, boys, uh, the, 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 I asked her her favorite band. I think how maybe you remember better than I do, but I asked her favorite band. Oh, I know. I said, do you like Kids on the Block? And because that was really like sac. I didn't like it. I mean, it was saccharine. It was the opposite of what I wanted. I wanted something more real. And she said, no. I said, well, what band do you like? And she said, they might be giants. Right, yeah. Really off the wall. I mean, I love, I knew them, the giants. And and um, and that was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting, you know? And so, yeah, so there was, she just, you're, you're totally right. I mean, I had two jobs to do, create a good show and find the person to do it, and she was it. The overtraining thing, too, it's crazy because it's almost like they, they tried to mold them into, like, what politicians are, you know? Like, you just want to hear the correct thing. So if you ask 
90 kids at that time. Do you like New Kids on the Block? They're, oh, yeah, they're the most popular band. I love them. Right. And it's like, okay, you're not being yourself. The fact she could just say, nah, they suck. That's oh. like it's such an eye-opening, like, bam, you know, like just – that makes you stick out, so that that's real cool. Um, what was the concept behind Sam coming up the ladder? I really want to know that. Like the guy was a mess. He never, his hair was never done, and he was the ladder always there. Or did he bring it himself? How did this work? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple of things about Sam. If you don't mind, if I digress a little bit. Yeah, go on. So there was in the pilot a different Sam, and he just really didn't make it. He just couldn't handle. Uh, performing and uh, and then um, uh, uh, Sean O'Neill came in and uh, Sean had his hair perfect and you know he was you know ready for his performance you know and everything and I, I liked him I liked that he had a lot of quality that was cool he was laid back um, I could see he was a good kid and he'd be interesting right but I said, look, you've got to leave the room. I want you to leave the room and mess up your hair and come back and read again. So he went out of the room, messed up his hair, probably thought I was nuts, right? He thought I was crazy. And he came back in and he read and his hair was that way. And I was like, okay, that's it. Perfect. Nice. That was how Sam, I wanted Sam to be cool. You know, I wrote a novel of Clarissa where Sam is – you know, becomes the person you think he would become. Um, but anyway, so here's the thing about the latter. It was really simple on one level. Since I knew her bedroom, you know, every TV show has a home set. Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah, home, yeah, yeah. Like some set that they use over and over again, like in Dick Van Dyke, it was a living room, you know, whatever the central set is, you know, it's like the equivalent of a of a uh, talk show that the where the host sits, you know what I mean? Yes. So to me, her bedroom was the home set. You know, it wasn't the living room, it wasn't coming in the house. Like if you think about it, I, I'm pretty sure Leave It to Beaver hardly ever went to Beaver's room, right? Mm -hmm. Like Leave It to Beaver was always in the living room, always yeah. with the family, in the kitchen, right? So to me, the idea was that her bedroom was home base. That's what I mean, not the home set, home base. And so, and the next step was, well, Sam's got to visit her. Does he really have to go to the front door, knock on the door, say, oh, hi, Mrs. Darling. I'm here to visit Clarissa. Do every, does everybody have to decide whether that's okay or not? Mm. And think about it. Or can I just throw a ladder and have him come through the window? <laughs> right, but it's smart though, like, cause you also can, ca yeah, you also capture like kids at that age sneaking in and out, you know? Right, right. Smart. And and that since they were just friends, because she wasn't really looking for a boyfriend, you know, it starts getting dealt with later in the show. And it definitely, you know, if I, it, it'd be different now. But in those days, you could do that, right? Because the sexual behavior wasn't that hot at that moment. You know, I'm sure there were some places where it was. But since they weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, they were just friends. It was really kind of non-gender bias. Um, you know, it's a boy. But, you know, honestly, I have to say Pete and Pete kind of had some of that, too, because Pete and Pete was she's a girlfriend, but not a yeah, but not a girlfriend, you know. And so, you know, it was uh, but it really was a very practical idea. I didn't want to have to write an entrance every time for him. In the, but it became a fun entrance. Yep. And the ladder was always there. So there you go. All right. Always want to know that. I, I'm not going to ask you what brand of ladder, you know, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but was there ever a sequel in the world? The ladder was only this tall, you know. Really? Oh, yeah, because the set. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you should have made him climb a full ladder. Like, just every time. time. <laughs> Had a workout while going up to the room. So was there ever, like, when the show was done, was there ever, like, a thought or uh, something in the works that, like, okay, we're going to redo it, maybe while she's a little older? Did that ever come about? Oh, I mean, I've been trying to do it for twenty, for thirty years now. <laughs> <laughs> Would she be on board with it? And other stuffs holding you up? Well, you know, I did do. Well, I have a terrible story where I um, I did sell a, a pilot to CBS when she was off the first show, mm -hmm. and it was her in New York City, eighteen, and she was um, uh, working at a newspaper, and I had cast Robert Klein as her. 
publisher or boss and all these great actors were in it. We built the set. And then uh, some bad people kind of got me fired. This sounds like a pattern now, I know. And, uh, and I got, uh, I got fired. I called, I became a zombie producer. Uh, I called that because I got, I got the show taken away from me and they hired another writer who didn't like Melissa and didn't like it. And they took out all the talking to camera and all the fantasies and all the graphics and everything that made it great. They took it out. And I said, why are you doing this? They said, well, you know, network audiences won't put up with that postmodern shit. And of course they do stuff like that all the time now, <laughs> you know? And so I was fired on my own show, but I couldn't leave. Uh, because I would be violating my contract and they had the right to do that. So I was stuck there and that didn't work. And then everybody blamed me for it, but it wasn't my fault. Then um, they took off, they took out all the good stuff. Then I did, oh, then I had a deal to do um, a, a new show with Melissa as her, as the mom and her daughter. And, uh, and then that didn't go. And we'll see. There's, there's some, there's still some very good possibilities. That's such a huge show to criticize and not want to bring back. Just with all the things that they're doing now. I mean, look at every movie: live action Lion King, live action this. Yeah. And it's like I feel like those are more poor ideas than to bring back Melissa Joan Hart and do Clarissa explains it all as she's older. Like I would be more inclined to go watch that right. than to go watch the live action Lion King. I still haven't seen it. I don't care. I don't care to see it. It was a cartoon. Why are you doing this? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think there's hope. All right. That's always good to hear, man. Uh, I do have one more question. What was your, aside from yours, what do you think was the best show on the network of all time? I mean, besides my show, you're going to ask me to vote against my show. <laughs> well, I can't because I don't want to make it. The if second says, best. If someone's, yeah, the second best. <laughs> There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Pete and Pete and Ren and Stimpy were the best. Okay. Pete and Pete was underrated. Very right. underrated. I think Pete and Pete was the boy show that I wanted to do. You know, I didn't really get to do it. I think those guys, Chris Biscardi and Will McRobb. Uh, Will McRobb did this pilot for Amazon that they put on that was genius, and they didn't pick it up. I mean, uh uh, a kid called mayonnaise. It was so good. I think even Stranger Things is really taking the vibe of Pete and Pete, mm. and turned it into something really cool. You know? Yeah. So, well, I think Pete and Pete. Uh, I really. I mean, I liked a lot of what a lot of people. Obviously, Rugrats I thought was brilliant. Uh, Doug was brilliant. Um, uh, sitcom wise. I mean, the thing is that, I mean, and I know there's a lot of problems around uh, John Chris Belusi and, and his behavior and all this other stuff and everything. But it was like we talked about before, it, it, reset, the, it reset the clock on animation. Mm -hmm. And there'd be no SpongeBob if it weren't for Ren and Stimpy. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, everything, I mean you go everything down the line from there. Just as far as the, the subject like the material that they covered, there would be no South Park. There'd be no uh, Rick and Morty. It's like, you just keep going down the line, you know? That's funny. I swear this is true. I don't have proof that it's true, but it's either something I imagined or it's something in my memory. Sometimes it gets hard to tell the difference, but I swear the South Park guys, maybe somebody can find out that we watched a pilot at Nickelodeon for South Park. Really? 96, 97, that yeah. could be possible, yeah. I think they submitted it to us and we passed on it, which thank God for saying right. that we did. But we had a lot of shows uh, offered to us that there was this weasel show, Weasel Patrol, that was brilliant. And I really wanted them to pick that up. That were really, It was really funny. We had... We had. I was in development, so I saw all the possible shows, just like seeing Andy Kaufman, right? Right. I swear I saw South Park and and we didn't pick it up, which is, I you think, know, good. You know what the thing is? I never understood this because 
you hear so many stories like this of like, well, they didn't sign this guy and they let this show go and they passed on Rocky. And like, when they have people like you, where you have a resume of successful shows that you've created, like you clearly have an eye for right. it. But yet executives who do not have any clue what the creative process is, they don't, they, they're very tone deaf to things that are going on. It's like, why are they the ones making the ultimate decision? And then when you're like, hey, this, this is going to be something. And they're like, no, nah, we don't think so. Well, what's think- your track record to believe that you're going to be right here? Listen, there's three categories. There's the audience. There's the creators. Well, there's the audience and there's the creators. And then there's the network. Mm. And, you know, the audience and the creators... And these days, sometimes there's a chance for them to get together without the network, right? More and more. Yeah. But there's no doubt that there are shows of mine that didn't get picked up that audiences would love and, and people and, and different things, like you say. But the people in the middle, their job isn't really to listen to creators. They're supposed to be deciding. Yeah. And they're the keepers, and that's how they keep their job. Their job is based on telling people what to do yeah. and hey, who's going to watch what. But that said, it becomes a game. I'll tell you, I see it as a game. Like I just had a show that was at uh, one network, one streamer. Uh, this is starting three years ago. was at one streamer. We had a deal. We wait around. The politics change at that network. And we and nothing. We we we're ready to sign the contract. The contract doesn't get signed. We fig, I figure out well. There's something not right here. We reach the you know somebody on our behalf reaches somebody high at the network. We find out oh they eliminated that division. Mm. And so we take that show now and we sell it to another network. All big network. All streamers. Big streamers. Yeah. Right. And now we're at this streamer developing it for two years. We have a pilot, we've changed the characters, we've done this, it's really great, it's fantastic. And then one day, they call us to say, and we've handed in, it's time for them to say yes or no. And they say, you know, we've got this new way we're gonna do production, and the network is deciding, and we're not. We're only gonna do branded com, uh, content, uh, we can't do anything original like this, so we've gotta let it go, right? And, and it's gone. Now me, I'm like, okay, let me see if I can sell it again. You know what I mean? Bear in the Big Blue House, I sold three times before it went. Jeez. And so to me, it's like, it's not my favorite thing about the business, but it's a game. It's like, you know, kind of F you guys. I'm going to, all right, next thing, I'm going to figure out how to sell this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And see how to beat the system. And so that's what I do. I just spend a lot of time trying to beat the system. You know? do, they, right. do they always have like... Uh... The, the executives at the networks, do they have a lot of buzzwords? Like when you're pitching a show and they're like sitting there writing them down, like, oh, he said this and he said that. We don't want this one. Well, you know what I do? I try to figure out what their buzzwords are. Yeah. Because I don't really care about the buzzwords. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I know that at Disney, let's say, they're looking for this, this, and this, right? Or at Nick, they're looking for I go in there and I say, oh, this is – exactly what you're looking for my job is to give them at least what they think they're looking for you know even if it's something completely different i'm not worried that if i get to do the show it's going to be compromised because i'm going to do you know they're more likely to fire me than compromise my show you know what i mean right so you know so it i'm saying it's a it's a hell of a way to make a living but and all you know you look at and i've gotten better at pretending like i've never had a failure because I used to only talk about the failures, because I actually find the failures kind of interesting. But you look at my successes, and, and it's actually a lot for, for one writer, right? But the truth is there are big drops. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Where you get, you get fired on your own show. Oh, my God, nobody will ever hire me. You know what I mean? Oh, I lost this show. I'll never get another of this. You know? And it takes a while to figure out how to go. It's why I did animation, puppets, live action, novels. Because when somebody... When somebody doesn't like when I get pissed somebody off or someone doesn't like me, I go to the next thing, you know, yeah. and just keep going. And they and forget it. Yeah, that's really cool, though. It shows how exhausting the business could be, man. Like, always talking to people who are in it, like, 
Hey, you know, it's like an Instagram. It's like Instagram. You only post the good stuff. You don't see the back end of, yeah. you know, your some people's lives aren't as great as it might appear. Oh, so yeah. To hear the, most, like, people, most people's uh, lives are not as great. Because exactly. <laughs> you're not going to post the, the shitty stuff. So, like, they hear yeah. you actually be open about, like, how tough it is to get, like, the ups and downs, the roller coaster of the business, which I'm sure we all know, but to have someone talk about it, it's not all glory and glamour. It's really cool, man. Oh, listen, I wrote a, a story for The New Yorker. I got a story of mine in The New Yorker. I had 21 rejections before I got that story. In. Jeez. So. Yeah. But you seem all right about it. Honestly, like, <laughs> you, have a, like, you have like a good positive vibe. I've, like there's yeah. a lot of people who you got to be equally mentally tough to be in that business, you know? Well, I feel it's my job to be uh, accepted or rejected. Like yeah. I've done my job if I get it. Like the thing I can't stand is if I can't get my idea to somebody I think will buy it. If they won't look at it and say yes or no, that pisses me off, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like I haven't done my job. In fact, I won't give up until I get them to respond, right? Whereas if they say no, I'm like, great, I did my job. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. yes, I did my job, either way. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, not everyone's going to like or dislike your stuff. It is what it is. So that's cool. Mitchell, really cool. Thanks for taking some time out in the wonderful country you're in right now while we're stuck in a, a tiny state here in the USA. Um, really appreciate it. Where can we catch you? And uh, give us some stuff you're working on now if you're allowed to talk about it. Well, I've got uh, – I'll just sort of generically talk about, I guess, I've got a – a show in Australia that I'm looking for, the, the, um, a show where uh, I'm hoping to do down there. Um, uh, what else I got? I've, I've got that show that's already been two places and I'm going to a third place. <laughs> um, I have a couple animation series. Uh, I'm doing a documentary that's wild about a woman who took a piano down the Amazon wow. uh, to play piano for people. Oh. Uh, I have lots of like really crazy projects. Uh, you know, I'm doing something about a corset maker and, uh, you know, I just, I, I have eclectic, you know, stuff. I always have a lot of them. Right. It sounds cool. I just like, I realize how much of a failure I am. I've never, I can't even play a piano key and this lady is taking one down the Amazon to perform. Like, what am I doing with my life here? Like, <laughs> you got a podcast. I think that's pretty good. Podcasts are hot. I'm all yeah, for it. They are make music that a few people listen to but it is what it is Mitchell thank you very much I won't give your location out but enjoy the weather enjoy the country it seems awesome man and thank you so much for joining us thank you guys it's been fun thanks man